Why don't we get started? Um, we know that some people will come down after Sunday school opening, uh, but we want to be mindful of our time, and we've got a lot to squeeze in this morning. If you can indulge, whoa. <laughs> I'm going to go stand over here. Um, if you'll indulge me for a few minutes, uh, I want to tell a story about yesterday that does relate to the building. And so if you, if you give me a minute. Um, yesterday we had two events going on here simultaneously. We had um, a funeral upstairs uh, in the afternoon, about 40 people, and then we did a reception in the children's area. And then all morning into the afternoon, uh, Santa Maria partnered with the Latino Health Council on South Park Street to do a conference here, which had about 200 people in it. And so I came in in late morning uh, to get ready, and this room's full, which is why the tables are set the way they are. We didn't have time to change it over for forum, so that's why that is what it is. But they had breakout rooms in L40 and the youth room and the Luther room and the library. And it was, there was a large number of people who had been in this country for less than a month. And it was partly, as I understand it, uh, a conference helping people navigate the health issue stuff in America, which I should have sat in on, I don't understand it myself. But you know, trying to work through, you know, what, what do you use the emergency room for, and urgent care, and how do you get health insurance, and how do you, how do you make sense of all that to first generation new immigrants. Okay? And then um, they broke for lunch. I, I did the pastor job and cut in line and I had myself a taco, it's pretty nice. But then they had a band playing up here. Um, I can't remember it in Spanish. A mariachi band up front, and they were doing a little dancing. Uh, and then after the funeral, when I came back down, I heard all, nothing but Spanish numbers. What? And I walk in, they're playing bingo, the whole room here, <laughs> which was awesome. So it was, what was amazing to me on the building front, so, so I had sort of three takeaways from this event yesterday. On the building front, we could have two events going on simultaneously and you could not hear the hymn and organ playing down here and you couldn't hear the mariachi band upstairs. And I was thinking, I don't know if this tank was built this way in 1923 or it had something to do with what Vince did in the 1990s, but it's amazing you can have all sorts of things going on and you can't hear it. Uh, that, was, that was pretty neat. It also struck me that we sometimes at Luther obsess about how parking drives our ministry, <laughs> pun intended. Um, you know, that we say, well, we can't do event A and event B because we're going to have a parking problem. And maybe we obsess about that a little too much because we had all sorts of things going on and it really didn't seem to be a problem. Though, to be sure, when I left, there were like 16 taxis all filling the alley. Right? And of course, me being a dumb American, I go up in the lock and I'm like, what are, you, what are you doing? Thinking there was an event at Porchlight. I'm like, oh no, we got calls to be here to pick people up. And I'm like, sure. Duh. You know, first generation people who have not been here long, working on housing, working on jobs, probably don't own a car. You know, and I just felt like an idiot going, well, I should have seen that, but still. Um, also, again, with the breakouts and everything going on, somebody had some foresight into just how do you get all these rooms to work so it just kind of moves seamlessly in and around and events going on, big conference, change over for lunch, change over for the mariachi band, change over for bingo, and it all just kind of moves. And I was just thinking how blessed we are uh, that people like Vince and others had such foresight to think how this can be used. That was one of my takeaways. My other takeaway was um, it was weird for me to go back and forth between upstairs and downstairs as I was getting ready, where upstairs are people who are grieving the death of somebody they love. And we are attempting to comfort each other with the promise of the resurrection. Right? It's a somber but celebratory event, as funerals are. And downstairs, I was thinking, it's a similar but different feeling in that I don't know what challenges some of the folks who just got here faced, and what family and friends they left behind in, what, in their country of origin. Um, but it was also, I would suspect, mournful but hopeful in a way. And, and it was a weird kind of feeling. I, don't, I haven't really sort of processed that, but uh, it was just odd to go back and forth. Um, and I was also sort of thinking of Lutheran world's history, since we have that on the brain, is that we are a rare Lutheran congregation in the sense that we were never 
a first generation immigrant congregation. Right? Started by students who wanted to worship in English, who were probably second or third or even fourth generation Americans. We don't have an origin story that has first generation, like, you know, the Norwegian church or the Swedish church or whatever, right? But now, 100 some years later, we get to experience that. You know, and I think that's kind of fun. Um, all, all of that sort of cultural thing that would have been common for Lutherans in, who have churches who had first generation experiences. So I thought that was sort of really sort of fascinating to see and experience. And then the third one takeaway I had from that is I know in my job how this building uh, facilitates and helps our outreach and evangelism. Right? Some of you can tell stories about coming here and the doors being open and, 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 that, and the ways in which the space has been used to assist the congregation's ministry. And I guessed that it would assist Santa Maria too, but I didn't experience it until yesterday. Partly, somewhere along the lines, this became their home. Because they knew where everything was and every the closets, and they're just moving around and doing stuff. I'm like, they're not guests anymore, and which was kind of a neat thing. Uh, I don't know when that happened, but it was, it, was a, it was a lovely thing. But then Juan Carlos was taking people up in the nave. And a number of people, again, maybe only been in America a month or two, said it, it made them feel like home. Which, of course, the kind of classic architecture that we do would have some similarities in Central and South America for some church buildings. And, and so I think Juan Carlos was experiencing what I have, which is the way, again, when the building is an, an asset to, to evangelism and to our work and our mission. Juan Carlos also told me, you know, because again, a number of the people there were currently unchurched because they just got to America, or may be part of one or more Roman Catholic churches in, the, in Dane County. And that I don't, don't want to speak ill of my brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church, uh, and I don't know if it's, a, it's a, if it's a language or a cultural issue, or if it was an issue with one priest, or if it's a diocesan issue, but the changes the, the church, Catholic Church made this summer, and the way in which they redesigned uh, all the sort of structure, how the parishes relate to each other, how the priests relate, many of the Latino community felt left out. And again, at least some were saying that, again, whether it's the bishop or the priest, somebody said, hey, if we want to do a quinceanera service, you've got to have at least six or eight people to make it worse, because we don't have enough priests to do this. Some of you are looking at me, you don't understand. So that would be the equivalent of me saying to the six wedding couples next year, I don't have time, so we're going to do all six weddings on the same day. That might be a problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so a number of people, Juan Carlos was telling me yesterday, were inquiring about whether they could do the quinceanera here. Right? And I just thought, there again, uh, the way in which uh, this space had be can become an asset uh, and a help to ministry. And so it's sort of neat to see and watch and experience Juan Carlos doing that, uh, giving tours. The owners of the local Spanish radio station were here, so they got a tour, and Juan Carlos was talking with them, and uh, they had never been here, and so on and so forth. And so they were going to do some promos for Santa Maria on the radio, and so it was really sort of this lovely thing. That was my yesterday. So I don't know if anything has anything to do with what Vince is doing, except, again, in a number of cases, I'm like, Vince and others knew what they were doing because it really worked well. So since he's coming, we should thank him for that. And now I'll turn it over to him to tell us what he did. <laughs> so. Thank you, Pastor Brad. So I'd like to start out by asking those here in attendance today, how many have been members here at Luther Memorial for at least 10 years? A lot of you. Keep your hands up if you were here at least 20 years as members. <laughs> Keep your hand up if you've been here at least 30 years as members. All right, that's when I entered the picture 30 years ago at Luther Memorial. And a lot of you are familiar faces throughout the years. Some of you are more familiar than others because um, we go back to 1993 or 92 is when we, we first entered the picture. And you had the confidence to hire Kubala Washatko Architects and this 12-year-old at that time that uh, <laughs> um, was an 
absolute awe of this place and really set out to begin to understand what we might do and what we might work together at accomplishing. So today what I'm going to share with you is what we've completed over the years. Some renovations, some additions, and a variety of other things that we've worked on. And then we'll leave some time for some questions and answers at the end. So I took a look back to see what have we been involved with. And there's like 30 projects that, uh, so that means we've been doing something almost one every year. Um, since we've been involved, um, sometimes three, four, and sometimes a little pause in there, but a pretty constant presence at this place here. And um, so it was, it took me back when I, I started to look back and I'm like, oh my. So what did, what did we get started with? Um, so Gary Brown did this incredible presentation about Claude and Stark, the architects that designed this place. Um, and we got these wonderful drawings um, that this is, you know, back then they could do a set of drawings that might have been 12, 15 pages long and that was all they needed. To do this Undercroft area we'd have to do a set of drawings that were 80 pages long and it still wasn't enough. <laughs> uh, so it, it demonstrates a little bit of difference in terms of how buildings were built back then. Architects were almost on the same plane as, um, they were almost called master builders because they were much more in the trenches every day with the contractors because since there were so few drawings, they were figuring out a lot of the details on site as things were built. And I honestly wish we could still do that. Um, it's a part of making that the creative process doesn't stop when you hand the drawings over to the contractor. You always see opportunities to make things better, to refine it. It's like an artist putting a, a, a chunk of clay on the potter's wheel and getting the rough shape in place and then stepping away and then letting the person after them that's selling the vase take it to the, to the finish line. And, there's so many missed opportunities for the refinement. So we do the best we can to communicate clearly. And fortunately, we've had a great partner along the way with uh, Vogel Brothers. And um, during those 30 years, I've worked with uh, probably six project managers, 15 superintendents. <laughs> um, but Vogel was still the constant throughout all of that, that they were always brought a high level of quality to the table. And that was really fantastic for us to, to know that we had a, a partnership or a team approach that everybody knew that there was a high degree of respect for this place and we need to bring our A game every single time. Um, this was one of these small projects that Pastor Harvey Peters said, um, we have a parking lot over there and we need to dress it up just a little. <laughs> Not too much, just a little. Because someday that would be sold and turned into Grand Central, which was um, a pretty valuable piece of property that uh, allowed um, Luther Memorial to do a lot of things. And then it came the time to look at this Undercroft lower level and I remember walking into this place and I think I stopped counting at like eight different floor level changes throughout here and and the goal was make it handicap accessible and we're like <laughs> how many elevators <laughs> and then we learned that this used to have a gymnasium in here where they could play basketball and it was blessed with this really tall ceiling height and so what we found is that let's find one floor level that connects as many of these different floor heights and that was that required us to raise this floor three feet so beneath your feet three feet lower is the floor level of what was the old gymnasium and there were bobcats driving around in here and bringing in sand and all that and um, and then for the first time we were able to get it handicap accessible and and then we connected to a ramp 
to a parking garage that was over there and a library and a nursery and kitchen, which there were, used to be a chapel in this space, um, <clears throat> and then the education wing. So then we moved from this lower level up into the nave and we sort of snuck a little bit into the nave from this lower level because we did an ice storage system and we said what if we saw if we could maybe steal a little bit of that air conditioning up into the nave and there was these two big supply grills on either side and and surprisingly it did the majority of the nave it didn't reach up to the balcony so that was kind of like free air conditioning almost for the nave but we then this the columbarium was one of the uh, first areas that we looked at and that the railing is constructed from the former communion railing that was on the chancel and there were other parts in there and then we added some stone caps to it and uh, so, um, yeah, columbarium came into play. So the, uh, the next thing was the transept balconies. And one of the things that we noticed is that the strong sort of gothic crossing of that transept was interrupted by these balconies and the sort of strong verticality of that space was just didn't feel right. And so that was um, the task that we need to look at getting rid of those. And so here is the process of opening that up and we see the, the, the steel arch in the transept of that truss that used to be in that area and so had to carefully take this transept apart and I remember conversations with the structural engineer Bob Corey and we were looking at the height of these 80 foot tall walls and he said today I couldn't do that <laughs> with that sort of masonry without all sorts of other things reinforcing those walls but empirically back then they said it would work um, and so uh, <laughs> we wanted to make sure that the removal of this transept balcony isn't going to somehow affect the stability of those walls and, and um, what we came back was is that you no, know, by the intersecting of those corners of the walls that gives it its uh, bracing strength that it needs. So then the transepts are opened and it really begins to you see the, the, the reason for that wanting to go away and, and how that begins to feel in the space. And even a small chapel on the side. And that, that, uh, that grill in there, that was the, on either side, that's where the air conditioning was introduced. And then the return air grills were all the way at the back side and so it pulled that cool air all the way through the, uh, through the nave. So when I was looking at this and I thought, is that a picture of me? <laughs> it's like, it almost looked like me. And I'm like, no, that's the guy at the silk screen shop. Um, that I went down there to um, look at the progress of these liturgical ceiling panels that we had placed in the transepts and so um, he was um, running it through um, a mock-up test so that we could see what these um, uh, liturgical screens could look like and then the photo on the left is the the painter putting the finishing touches on the wooden battens that uh, um, created this grid on the on the transept ceilings. <clears throat> so what you can see is just the hints of them on either side and you see the dark wooden ceiling um, up above uh, with the, uh, the ceiling wood boards up there. So next came the nave renovation. Um, and part of the challenge with the nave was a challenge and a blessing. The acoustics in that space are fantastic for musicians and singing because there's a three and a half second reverberation. But it was very challenging for speech intelligibility. 
Um, and so the solution was to put these pubac speakers every other row to be able to um, not have to overcome that long reverberation time to, to dial it in uh, more correctly or to make it more intelligible. And even having a sense of um, as pastor processes, um, it knows where, that, where he is at and it, it changes the, the position of where that sound is coming from or the, 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 the feeling of where that sound is coming from. Uh, so the, the one part that we were not involved with um, was the narthex area. That was uh, completed just before we got started. Um, and along with that was the baptismal font and the paschal candle. <clears throat> uh, we moved the pulpit. Those of you may remember that it used to be on the east side and the pulpit got moved to the west side. And then the apse, um, that became part of the renovation. Um, the, the photo on the top right, that is, they took a rubber casting of one of the rosettes that you can see um, right in here. Um, and it was part of um, that cornice that we needed to restore. Um, and then looking at a new stenciling pattern that uh, started to really bring into to focus a lot of things that were intended in the original drawings but were never realized. Um, even back then they had to value engineer things. <laughs> um, so one of the things that uh, you, you'll notice a difference, the arches or these ribs in the, in the apps are painted gold. And in the Claude and Stark drawings, those were shown as wooden arches um, that were meant, and the proscenium arch was supposed to be wood as well, and, and so it got changed to plaster and then painted gold. And so there was our opportunity to respect that, to see if we could restore or get back to the, the, the design intent. Um, the scaffolding going all the way up to that ceiling I remember a time, um, I'm not great with heights, and I think the contractors knew that. <laughs> and I white knuckle climbed all the way up to the top of that scaffolding, and it was lunchtime, and the contractors were like, let's play a little joke on Vince here. <laughs> and that scaffolding had just enough shimmy in there, and they all started doing this together. <laughs> and the scaffolding started to move, and I'm like, Am I feeling something or is that like, what's going on here? <laughs> and it was like, they all had a good laugh at my expense and the whole way down I white knuckled it back down to the floor and I'm like, poof. <laughs> I have a total appreciation for anyone that has to work at great heights. Um, I'd spend most of my time thinking about how am I not gonna fall or hurt myself. <clears throat> So one of the other things for the apse renovation was the lighting of the altar um, before it, it had, um, I don't know if I have a photo that goes back that far. It, it was fairly dark. There was really nothing that highlighted all of the detail. And so part of that opportunity was to look at lighting under that edge, lighting under that edge of the, um, the candle niches, um, just to really highlight all of that detail that was flat before, that just really wasn't brought into focus. And now you see the apse with the, the wooden um, ribs and the proscenium arch, um, so that it, it really, you can see how all that structure was intended to be of that, um, the timber framing. And even those column capitals are lit just to give you a sense of how large those are, I stood inside of one of those column capitals and was mocking up some aiming of the lighting. It's, it's like this, it's, it's huge. And then the, the stenciling, how that eventually, it, it, it had its gradation of the stencil where it, it culminated at the top where it had the, the darkest blue and then 
some of the heavens and the stars uh, shown at the very apex of that. Uh, also part of the apse, the Riverdose stone, that was all cleaned at that point. Um, so just all of that detail, um, just really properly lit, nicely cleaned, um, was really uh, wonderful to get that restored to that point. Um, part of the apse too was to accommodate lay readers going to the lectern and we added a handrail to that side to just make it a little safer for um, someone uh, going to the lectern. How many of you remember the, um, the peninsula that projected out there and it was painted to look like uh, <laughs> Terrazzo? <laughs> it was only going to be temporary. <laughs> And temporary turned out to be a really long temporary. Um, so it was time to take the painted particle board out of there and put it into something that is of a, a, a greater permanence and, and really uh, feeling more at home in the nave. And part of that was to um, come back with a stone that then had an inset maple wood floor and that was to make a linkage back to the wood floor that's under the pews so that it all felt like it was um, on the same uh, song sheet as the rest of the nave. Uh, so the aria balcony. When these transept balconies were removed that gave us an opportunity for um, these small little soloist balconies to be introduced into those transepts. And here you can see the, the these are not voiced organ pipes, they're just decorative, um, but they were of the gold theme and, and there was an opportunity to um, bring that into the, the, the new color context of everything else that's happening in the nave. <clears throat> and so there you see the, uh, the repainted, um, transept organ pipes and the, the aria balcony. Tracker organ. Um, an opportunity presented itself for Luther Memorial to obtain a tracker organ. And a tracker organ is one that has all sorts of mechanical actions where you feel very connected to that organ because you're you're moving levers and pedals and everything that it's it's um, very the musician is very connected to that organ and so this was an opportunity to find its home in the east transept and then to um, repaint the organ pipes and to restore and clean and tune uh, the tracker organ the choir balcony. Um, we had an opportunity to go up there and to um, renovate that space. Part of it was to give it some greater flexibility for, um, there was all curved pews up there and, and if we could remove a portion of them so instrumentalists could be up in that area where the seats could be rearranged to, to give some space for it. Um, we wanted to improve the air conditioning up in that space. I remember um, uh, Ryan from Vogel Brothers squeezing underneath the choir risers in there and, and, and I was like, is there room enough for a duct in there? And, and he came back out and he's like, well, if I fit in there, maybe there's room enough for a duck to fit in there, but no more. And it was very, very tight. And, uh, and, and there were the, um, there's these two shafts that are on the north side of the building that were connected to an organ blower room that's down in this level. And, and you always want that organ blower motor to be as far away from the worship space as possible so that it doesn't make noise or you hear that in the worship space. Well, that was our opportunity to bring air conditioning up to the balcony and to um, get pipes and other things that otherwise would be very disruptive to find its way up to the balcony. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so that, there you see some of the chairs uh, <clears throat> and the decorative railings. Then we moved our attention to the East Wing. And this was an opportunity that Luther Memorial could get this building on um, the historic register and um, be eligible for historic tax credits, state historic tax credits. And that was, that was huge in terms of getting 20% of the cost of the renovation back in tax credits and then since Luther Memorial's nonprofit they could sell their tax credits and back then you would get like 90 cents on the dollar. So, um, but then that said, everything we do has to be respectful of the 1950s building and it sort of set the palette of what we could and could not do. Um, <clears throat> so up in the office wing on the upper floor, we, one of the things is we replaced all the windows to get them back to the, um, the steel sash windows that were um, original to the building. Uh, lots of wonderful light in all the office spaces. In the, um, on the education wing, now getting that on the, the level that is closest to the worship space um, for parents with young children is, was the, uh, the focus. <clears throat> and so here's one of the things that I wouldn't do vinyl tile <laughs> in a education space today, but since it had asbestos vinyl tile back in the 50s, we had to come back with that. And we had to come back with the same sort of metal door frames and the same kind of wood doors so that it, it was of that era um, that it was restored to. So um, it was not that difficult to work with, but it, it, was, it was pretty telling in terms of what we could do versus what we couldn't do. So if you don't follow the rules, you don't get the, the tax credits. So obviously we, we follow along. One of the, the big things here was to get an elevator that actually goes all the way up <laughs> to the upper level and all the way down to the lowest level um, versus the elevator that's over here that just serves a couple levels. And, you know, as even the way that that building is, is set where it has, it's like partially below grade for that level and then it's still another level below that yet too. And just like this level here is, you think you're at the lowest level and no you're not, over there is another basement level that goes down even further that it's so many levels in this space that uh, it, it's amazing. Um, and yet it works with all of its site constraints. So the food pantry, um, that was an area that it, it was used by the Boy Scouts for years. Um, and then this was an opportunity to be able to bring the elevator down to that level and to serve that as well. Uh, the sign outside, we had designed it years ago uh, and then it was damaged, a uh, car ran into it, and so that was an opportunity for us to restore it, and then to also add some additional courtyard lighting in that space to, uh, <clears throat> and actually improve the lighting since now we can do things with LEDs and, and the like. Um, shading study. <laughs> um, so this housing project next door was coming into play, and we wanted to know what effects is it going to have on the nave during a worship service, so let's model it and see. And we correctly showed that it does shade the nave during the worship space. We were trying to negotiate with the neighbor to see what sort of leverage we had, um, and apparently um, they had more leverage than we did, so <laughs> they, they could do it. <laughs> 
Uh, the nave lighting. So the story goes that years ago these fixtures just like these were there and there was the hand crank that would lower those fixtures all the way to the floor for um, changing the light bulbs and the mechanism failed and it came crashing to the floor and it was so crazy that everybody got very concerned and at that time all of them were removed and replaced with these really awful gymnasium lights. <laughs> it was, that was the most ugly type of light that you could imagine and the ceiling went dark. You had no appreciation for these, these carved wooden trusses that are up there um, and we were able to find one light fixture still in existence and I think it was in a member's backyard and they were using it as a bird feeder. <laughs> and that fixture, just to get, it's, it's this high, that fixture. And so we took that fixture and we measured it and scanned it and, and got it all to where it's pretty close to what's there. But then we um, changed the lighting optics so that we could light up and illuminate the ceiling, light down so that the congregation has proper lighting and give it a glow um, so that it, it, it appears that all the lighting is happening from the side of the thing and, and really that's doing very little of it. It's all the up and down is doing the, the workhorse of the lighting. So you can see that the, the, um, the ceiling just has a glow to it now where it before was for many many years was just black up there and you couldn't appreciate that. And so then we got to what we thought is the completed nave <laughs> and true to form there's always another project on the horizon and we understand that an, an organ replacement is often in the near future here and so we're uh, working with them to make certain that all of those things coordinate with everything else that we've got going on in this space. Um, and since I was 12 when I first started this project, <laughs> I'm now nearing retirement and it's time for uh, me to hand off in a, in a couple years um, to Ethan Bartos and Therese Hansen, who's been working alongside me for all these years. Um, not all of the 30 years, but a great many of them. So Ethan's been with uh, TKWA for 25 years and Therese has been with us for 10 years. So they've got a great knowledge and have been working alongside and so I, I do whatever I can to make certain that I hand off as much information as I can so that they can continue to be stewards of this place that uh, you all also call home and we've been privileged to be a part of the journey for restoring this. So thank you very much for allowing us to, to help you and I'd open it up to any questions that you might have or comments. Yes? Um, you mentioned about the challenge of leveling the floor in this area and adjoining areas. That was accomplished by, by the time we got here, but I didn't know how. But Randy Raj explained to me that one of the ideas for accomplishing that came from Lee Powell. Of course. <laughs> Lee, I would be remiss to say that if we didn't have Lee along for the ride, it would have been a much more difficult ride because Lee is like the savant of everything Luther Memorial that he has this bank of knowledge that is deep and wide and, and you guys probably have no idea how valuable he has been to our team. So thank you Lee for all of your help all those years. <laughs> There are several others that uh, 
are along the way that were helping um, us to understand this place because it's, it's honestly, we felt like we need to understand who Luther Memorial is and the, the different building committees that we worked with, the different pastoral leaderships that we worked with along the way were very gracious in helping us understand what is the appropriate gestures along the way and, and what we, once we understood those sort of gestures then we were there to execute those gestures and then they they worked very graciously alongside of us um, through the preliminary design phases, through the fundraising phases, through the construction. It, it was always a pleasure of ours to work with the various folks that were involved in, in that. And that is one of the long-standing uh, persons that we've worked with. Um, Annette would always be, I always called you my aesthetic um, sort of uh, check of like, is this, does this pass the Annette test? <laughs> and she's pretty spot on in terms of really um, seeing something pretty quickly and, and giving us a sense of if that's yes or no. And, and, and I always enjoyed working with you, Annette, to, to figure out what's the right gestures to, to do here. So thank you. Yes? Is there a vision for, for stenciling or anything back on the arches on the side? Um, so there was a question, is there the future for additional stenciling along the sides or the shields? Maybe. And I always say maybe because I don't know for certain. Um, I think that the reality that we found is that you're never done in a church. It's just you're continuing to um, shepherd this facility along and you, you always know that you have to be very flexible in terms of, of what gestures are appropriate as we move forward. So I'll say maybe. <laughs> yes? When the historical designation came through, you mentioned that it was kind of pegged at the 1950s. Why was that? Good question. Why was it pegged at 1950s? Because the rules are that you have to select your period of significance um, for the building that you're working on. And then you have to um, be consistent with that all the way through. You can't like pick um, 1950s for the windows and go to 1970 for the carpet. And you have to pick one point in history and that period of significance and stay consistent because otherwise it would look like the, the, the story that they're trying to say is that people can read the history of this building and they can see what its former uses were and, and the architecture is honest and true to that response. So that's, that's the rules that we have to abide by. I know that many times I'll, I'll be working on a on a historic building and it's tempting to say, oh, well, the details of this era were much more um, appropriate or detailed, but over here it's a lot easier. We can save cost because you know what? They didn't have um, a lot more expensive details that we just can't afford. Well, the historic folks are saying, no, you, you have to pick one and work with that all the way through. <clears throat> one of the things that I have been really honored in my career to work on is historic structures. And I've worked on probably more than 100 historic structures um, during my time. And I find them probably the most fascinating work that I've been privileged to be involved in. I always like to say that it's like this 500 piece puzzle that you're given and you dump it over and you only have 300 of the 500 pieces and then you have to figure out what the other 200 missing pieces are. And you do that with what limited information you have, photographs or historic drawings or 
people that share stories with you that uh, um, help you understand what the history of. And that was the case here too, is that we, we um, had very limited kind of drawing information, but we, we knew um, what all the different uses were, and so it's, it's always um, a fun challenge to be able to put that puzzle back together again and do something that honors the building that you're working in. Yes? Um, yeah, so was the addition like on the east side of the church with the older of the two elevators, is that something you guys did or is that already here? That was already here. So that addition was built in the 50s and that elevator was done before us, I want to say that it was in the late 80s, early 90s, does that sound about right on that? 83? 83? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of set like a level that you had to keep on this floor so you didn't have to like replace their chain. Exactly. Okay. That was one of the seven or eight floor levels that we had to try to align with. And that one was the one that we picked to align with um, because there was just so many other right. levels that were happening around here. Are there like pictures or plans from what it looked like before the 90s renovation, like with all levels anywhere? Back then, I, I was astounded by how few pictures I took. <laughs> And today, I can't go to a job site without taking my phone out and taking 50 photos. Um, and then I, I looked at the few photos that I got and they were so grainy and out of focus and dust is floating in the air and, and it was just, I'm like, how did we, how did we even document things back then? And, and it's, it, it was a different era and, and a different way of, of documenting buildings. Um, but we, we had, I had to dig through 30 years of, of archives and we actually saved all of the projects. Um, most architects only save their work back 10 years because that's a code requirement. I save it infinitely if it's a historic building because I always feel like that's going to be of value to somebody down the road. Um, so, um, but unfortunately our photo documentation during the process was fairly spartan. Can you talk a little more about the hanging light restoration? Um, you know, when you found the one in the first year's backyard, yes. and who made the new ones? And yes. You know, how expensive was it, Mr. Rockley, and what is that done? Okay. Um, now you're going to challenge my memory on this. There was a a metal fabricator here in Madison, um, I can picture the guy's face. Um, <laughs> what's that? Yes, yes, um, it'll come to me. Um, but what was really helpful is that guy was good at um, laser cutting steel so that we could get the decorative elements into that fixture. Um, and we went and we mocked it up. We had, um, so we had big lifts in the, um, in the nave and part of that is we had to check the load carrying capacity of the floor of the nave and then of the lift because the lift has to get 80 feet high in the air and that's a pretty heavy lift. <laughs> um, and making certain that it didn't damage the flooring up there and and so we, we had uh, one of those fixtures up there and then we, uh, at the time, when we did those, they weren't, LED wasn't yet available and so we were working with the best available lighting optics that we had. Um, and if I were to do it over today, I would probably find a way to, um, electrically raise and lower those fixtures. I'm told there's a crew here called high maintenance. <laughs> and those guys brave uh, the relamping where they erect scaffolding to get up to those fixtures. I would never go on that. <laughs> uh, and thankfully there are people that um, are willing to do that. Um, but that, you know, they, they, when LED came out they're saying, oh the fixtures 
you'll never have to relamp them. Well, that never came to reality because you do have to relamp even LED fixtures. They do go longer, they're not as hot, and we have, um, it's ever evolving. I can specify an LED fixture today that has four different color temperature ratings built right into the fixture and you can switch it right on site. And you can say, no, I want it warmer, cooler, cooler, there. <laughs> That's, it's just the, the technology that's evolving for lighting is um, pretty amazing. Um, and for us to be able to, today we can model that to where we can get a sense of what the fixture looks like in terms of its, its light output and all that. Back then, we didn't have that available to us. We, we went through conventional um, foot candle calculations and and you look at the nave ceiling is almost black and from a lighting perspective like these fixtures are reflecting off of a light ceiling and so you get a lot of bounce from that when it goes to that black ceiling it's like a sponge it just absorbs the light and stops there it doesn't contribute anything reflective back down that's why we had to have the down component of those fixtures to get lighting down to the congregation level Thank you. so Yes. About what time were the lights be on? Oh boy. Annette, can you help me remember that era? <laughs> it was, it was four, five? It was during uh, Shelly Bob's. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. That's almost 19 years ago. <laughs> 18, yeah. Yes. The lighting fixtures, I think they're beautiful, but I'm not sure they distribute light at ground level equally enough so that some portions of the nave it seems dim especially if you're kind of at the edge and then you stand up to sing a hymn you're in shadow to get there yeah and uh, i can understand that there's a limit as to how much you can turn the brightness up what there is today if we were doing it you can, you can change the optics for the, the throw of the light so that you get more overlap. We were sort of limited for the position of where those lights are um, in terms of, of where they're centered between each truss bay. So that, that was predetermined, the lighting spacing. Um, and the optics that we had available, and it, it feels like it's a big fixture and should be able to get a really widespread but it had, it had its limitations back then with the, the optics of the, of the light. The other thing is you don't want to have a glare issue as you look up into those fixtures. You want to not see this really glary. So you've got a, a louver in the bottom of that that keeps it so that you, you don't have um, glare issues in there. But yeah, it, it had its limitations. Can those be addressed? Yes. <laughs> it's time that you mention that, John. Um, we get most of our bulbs and equipment from electronic heaters control in Middleton, where Eric Sumi was the engineer for a number of years. We're in the early stages of retrofitting LEDs in all those lamps. It's a ten dollars to $20,000 project. We've got to change all of the dimmers that will work with LEDs and change all the LEDs and make sure when we change them that the church doesn't look orange or something, right? But the color palette goes crazy. <laughs> So Eric Sumi, Lee, Dave Hines, and Patrick are busy. They, we now have enough bulbs for two lamps, the front two, and we're going to do some testing on them sometime in the coming months to see how that all might work before we buy piles of bulbs, because again, it'll be nearly $10,000 worth of bulbs, uh, to, to change those all out. So Vince didn't know that, I don't think. Yeah, I do now. One of the very few things we've not consulted with him is yeah. we don't call them we're just, just changing bulbs. Yeah. <laughs> and, Me too. And, and you're, you're blessed to have Eric um, as a part of the congregation, and um, ETC is um, a fabulous lighting company that we've been working with for years, too. And, and it, it literally, what I specified two years ago in lighting, 
is already outdated. It's just this lighting industry is changing at an amazing pace and, and to, to keep pace with it um, is ever challenging. You try to, to pick what you think is going to go the longest distance possible and as soon as you do that something else outpaces it. So it's, it's, it's ever changing. All right, well, um, if there are no further questions, um, thank you again for trusting us to be along with you on this journey of this amazing, beautiful place. Um, yeah, the navigational tool of signage and, and just wayfinding in this area. It, it, yeah, it, it, is, it is complex um, and there's multi levels and just um, navigating is, is always a challenge and, and what we tried to do architecturally was to have the, the flow through the building be as intuitive as possible given the limitations. <clears throat> when we first came here it was just like I'm lost. <laughs> I don't know where I'm at. <laughs> and, and hopefully we've we've reduced some of that um, and added greater clarity to the flow through the building but it, it's always something that um, would be helpful to... Um, uh, I was just thinking of a, a simple exploded drawing mm -hmm. generated somehow and... You are here. Eight and a half by eleven. Yeah. Right next to the elevators, right next to the stairs. Yeah, yeah, not a bad idea. You are here, you are there. Yeah. You want to go there? Go yes. There. Yes, indeed. So, okay. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>